Good evening. There we go. Okay, people are on. So excited to have all of you here this evening. And we are going to get our program started right now. And as we start, I will just begin with a short word of prayer to open us up for this evening. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for bringing us together as a community, as a church family, and as friends to not only fellowship with each other, but also dive deep into your word and share what we learn from each other. Bless the proceeding of this program in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all this evening to another uh, wonderful town hall meeting series uh, this evening. So excited to see all those people that are on the Zoom line. And I know we have people probably on the Facebook line uh, who are viewing from Facebook. So all of our Facebook friends, we want to say welcome to you as well. We're so happy to have you. Uh, of course, if you would like to engage with us, if you'd like to comment, if you'd like to share, please do so in our uh, Zoom chat or even on Facebook on our Facebook chat, uh, and we will make sure that we get that uh, comment from you or that question that you may have. And we want you to be a part of the program. We wanna interact with you. We wanna communicate with you as best as possible. So please don't be afraid to use um, all of the mediums that we have to communicate, although we may not be here uh, in person. So we're gonna get the program started right away. I'm going to invite Chris uh, Penniman now, who's going to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Chris. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but um, I just want to once again, as Ashley said, thank you all for being here. And our speaker today, dynamic and outgoing speaker, he is currently the pastor of the New Adventist Church. Um, I talk to none other than Pastor Jamal Franklin. I welcome you as he comes. All right, thank you so much, Chris, and uh, AY leader, Ashley, and Pastor Scavello, um, my adopted father and mentor, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here um, to share a very interesting um, subject this evening. And I'm gonna ask Chris to put the presentation on the screen so that you can see the presentation the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I will, oh, I, I think it is a presentation that can be shared to you as well so that you can have it and you can research on it even further um, as we talk about um, crisis proof careers. Um, Ashley, is Chris online? Can everyone hear me well before we go on? And uh, can the presentation be put or shared on the screen because I'm on my phone? Okay, very good. Hear you very well. All right, very good. All right, you can put it in um, presentation mode so everyone can see it. All right, so this evening we're talking about CPCs and CPCs are crisis proof careers. And uh, we're gonna talk about some new careers. And I know some persons will have some questions about uh, the ethics of some of these careers. We're not gonna dive into that today. That is a whole different discussion. And so we're just gonna present those careers that quote unquote happen to be crisis proof careers. All right, can everyone see the presentation? All right, great. Next slide, Chris. So 20 years ago, we had Steve Jobs, Johnny Cash, and Bob Hope.
But now, 20 years later, we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. And so the question is asked, what am I supposed to do with no job, no cash, and no hope? One of the, next slide, Chris, one of the objectives of this presentation is to revive jobs, revive cash, and ultimately, most importantly, revive a sense of hope in us that is not dependent on cash and not dependent on jobs. So Anis Abedin, in an article in April 20 of 2020, he is a, an Asian, Middle Eastern. He wrote an article, and from this article, I got this quote, which gives us a sense of understanding of what's taking place as a result of COVID-19 and careers and the job market, even the financial market. He said this, given the magnitude of the coronavirus pandemic, all members of the workplace need market intelligence. Can you imagine that? What in the world is market intelligence on how their industries and consequently jobs will be impacted as well as guidance and coaching. And Dr. Scavella is a professional coach on actions that they need to take to ensure a promising and successful professional future in a post COVID-19 world. So this presentation is about giving us and educating us on market intelligence so that we can be better prepared for our jobs and careers and uh, academic courses that we would want to take post a COVID-19 new normal. Next slide, Chris. So the most in-demand jobs based on the statistics of LinkedIn in the month of June, 2020, they did a research on the number of job offers requirements that are being requested on LinkedIn. And they came up with these top jobs that are being requested as of June 2020 in more demand. Spoiler alert, these jobs that came up in demand in June 2020 have surged in demand because of the COVID, COVID virus. So the, on the top list, we have the software engineer, and that is a big thing because if you notice the statistics that the World Health Organization, the CDC is using to calculate in lifetime the number of positive COVID-19 tests, the persons who designed that software, even here in the Bahamas, we're using Habitat, which is a, an app, application to monitor those who are in quarantine, that is a career. Um, that is a, a program, an application that is designed by someone called a software engineer. So software engineers are in demand post COVID-19 as of June 2020. After that, the interesting thing is that doctors are not in demand, but nurses are more in demand than doctors are. And if you know anything about the healthcare system here in the Bahamas, in the world, in the in, in United States of America, in Europe, in uh, Central America, you would know that nurses are the missionaries. They are the soldiers who are in the front line of the medical world. And doctors oftentimes do a lot of scientific interpretation of medical data. Um, doctors oftentimes have to prescribe medication, but it is actually the nurse who administers the treatment, who administers the research, who administers the interpretation of medical data. Then we have salesperson drivers, we have supermarket department specialists, we have store associate supply chains managers, we have food service worker, and we also have certified public accountant project manager. These one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten careers are the most in demand careers as of June 2020. One interesting thing is that you would see certified public accountant. Why would an accountant be an in-demand job after COVID-19 or in the middle of COVID-19 as we are currently? 
Well, because certified public accountants, particularly auditors, they are specialized in cutting back budgets. And if you notice what's happening here in the Bahamas is that a number of hotels um, who were scheduled to open in August have now pushed back um, their openings some October, November, maybe some until next year indefinitely. And that is mainly determined by the certified public accountants that they consult, that they hire to look at their accounting financial projections, to look at how they can save money, to look at actuarial studies, et cetera, et cetera. So certified public accountants definitely is in this group of most in-demand jobs for June 2020. Next slide, Chris. Now, we have a situation, okay? The situation is that the United States of America Department of Immigration, all right, just announced earlier up this week and late last week, early this week, that all international students in the US who are not taking online courses needed to leave. Now they have rescinded that um, order, that amendment, um, that law, to allow for international students to remain on campuses, um, even though they may not necessarily be taking um, online, online classes. And I'm not going to go into detail about that, but there's a tricky gist to that. There's a reason why they have allowed international students to remain in the US. Isaac Collins, Joy May, Stephen Whistle on April the 17th, 2020, they compiled the list of the top 30 plus in demand college degrees um, in 2020 and beyond. And I want to list all of them so that you can get an idea as to where we're going about crisis proof careers. And while I'm reading the list, I want you to note carefully what is the most repetitive career that sticks out to you as I read the list. So here's the top 30 in demand college degrees. And parents, if you're online, Young people, if you're online, this is very important for you to take note of. One, petroleum engineering. Two, cybersecurity. Three, nuclear engineering. Four, software engineering. Five, physics. Six, computer science. Seven, chemistry. Eight, economics. Nine, electronics engineering. 10, information technology. 11, health informatics. 12, management information systems. 13, game design. 14, mechanical engineering. 15, public administration. 16, liberal arts. 17, biomedical engineering. 18, civil engineering. 19, industrial engineering. 10, construction management. 21, communications. 22, marketing. 23, accounting. 24, business administration. 25, finance. 26, management, 27, nursing, 28, political science, 29, education, 30, English, 31, genetic counseling, 32, occupational therapy, and 33, psychology. Now, you can put in the chat, you can put in the chat, what is the career that stands out to you the most? What is the most repetitive in-demand college degree that is on this list that has been drafted by Collins, Mays, and Wilson? Um, you can put your answer in the chat um, so I can see if we are all on the same ball. What is the most repetitive in-demand college degree based on this list? Anyone wants to share, put it in the chat so that I can see it. What is the most in-demand college degree? While you're, yes, yes, Abigail Clark. All I'm hearing is engineering. This was astonishing for me. And I'm gonna talk about this right now. I think I'm gonna mention it later on in the presentation, but let me talk about it right now. Engineering. Now, when we talk about engineering, we often think about designing of buildings, um, designing of, gadgets, all that kind of stuff. But if you notice, engineering has expanded into a field of science also, okay? Engineering has now become a college degree of science and where it has expanded to have so many different variations of engineering. 
One of the things that you would notice is that nursing, doctor, any, any science, any science um, college degree is not necessarily in demand now because in an essence, it has always and will always be a consistent degree. But one of the things that is very important to consider is that engineering is so important because engineering is altering the systems that we know. If you notice, number 17 talks about biomedical engineering. And then number 31 talks about genetic counseling, which there is also something called genetic engineering, where persons are going into fields of studies and demand college degrees to study how to create applications, how to create, how to create viruses, how to create vaccines, and how to create apps, and how to create models to be able, one, to predict human behavior, number two, to alter human behavior. And so we see a lot of engineering where that is what their main task usually is. They come up with designs, they alter designs, they implement new things to make new systems that function for the best we hope of humanity. And so engineering has expanded into a science of itself and has become the top in-demand college degree in 2020 and beyond. You know, when I was at Montreal Morales University lecturing, I had the privilege to lecture in two faculties as a chaplain. And I would teach them Bible, theology, and general ed courses. And one of the things I noticed was that in the faculty of information technology and engineering. I had a lot of students back in 2014 when I shared with them a similar presentation like I'm doing with you today. And I said to them, guys, you take your career for granted because you guys love video games and you think that engineering information technology is being able to manipulate, being able to play your video games well and create video games, et cetera. You, you guys are going into this as, as a hobby, a childhood hobby you have. But in, in 10 years or less, your degree in information technology and engineering is going to become in so much demand as the world becomes more digitalized and as we try to alter the makeup of humanity in terms of software development, um, data research, medical science intervention, you see biomedical engineering there, you guys are going to be the ones that companies will be looking for to, to hire because they're looking for the future. They're looking how to avoid crisis in the future. And they laughed at me and they said, no man, it will never be like that. And today I have five students who have been hired, one by Facebook and uh, th four in other private entities. And one of the tasks that they are doing is something they say to me they don't feel competent for because they're being asked to design and engineer things that haven't been thought yet by humanity. And I said to them in 2013, this was going to happen. And I hope that at the end of the presentation that you understand that there is some prophetic orientation to, to, to this. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knows that these in-demand college degrees in 2020 and beyond would have become in demand. And he's given us all the light, all the assurance in the Bible through prophecy to prepare for the direction the world is heading in. Next slide, Chris, please. <laughs> so this is the reason why engineering has become an in-demand degree. Because right now we are living in a world that is preparing for a robot revolution. Now I know you've heard this in movies, you have heard this when you were growing up. I heard this when I was growing up, but now we are actually on the verge of what we call a robot revolution. This is a job report prepared in 2018 by the World Economic Forum.
Okay, I hope you can hear me. So we have four different types of robots that are being engineered right now by engineers. We have humanoid robots, we have stationary robots, aerial and underwater robots, and non-humanoid land robots. There you have the percentage of the types of robots that are being used or being engineered and designed right now. The research says, says that by 2022, many companies will start incorporating this robot revolution into their hiring. So instead of hiring humans, they're going to be hiring more robots. And behind the robots, they will be hiring people who know how to program, alter, and control the functions of robots. And that is why engineers are in a demand. Look at the first movers of job markets that are going to start implementing, well, in fact, based on the research, they have already started funding the studies and the development of robots using engineers for this robot revolution. 35% is within the financial services and investors. 53% is within the automotive aerospace and supply chain. So if you notice, and if you watch NASA a lot, and if you watch how a lot of planes and cars and NASA spaceships are put together, many videos show you with actual human labor putting these things together. But if you look at China, if you look at some markets around the world, you will see how many robots are actually manufacturing and putting together these things that we use on a daily basis because the job market is becoming more robotic. The aerial and underwater robots are being used by oil and gas companies because with those robots, they can go high. We have them, we call them, um, uh, the young people like to play with them a lot. They're flying the air. What do we call them again? I cannot remember. Uh, and now we'll, we'll talk about it later. Drones. And then, <laughs> drones, that is correct. Drones can go high in the air, but they're also underwater drones that can go further into the sea, further into volcanoes, further into the source of the earth so that they can look for, for oil. And that is why the United States of America is so interested in the Middle East. And that is one of the things that the United States has been doing in the Middle East using drones, aerial and underwater robots to be able to look for oil and gas. And then 42% um, of companies in automotive, aerospace and supply chain are also using non-humanoid land robots to test vehicles, to test spaceships, to test supply chain and their capacity to keep some sort of consistency. And this is the thing that robotic revolution causes. It means therefore that the production rate in the job market based on the implementation of this robot revolution is going to increase. So that means they're going to be able to do quite a better job faster than human labor can. And so humans, 2022, will be competing in a job market, in a career market where robots are being considered and compared to humans' capacity to produce, whether we can produce quicker, more efficient, more accurate or not. And hence why engineers are becoming so in demand. Go on to the next slide, Chris, please. So that was up to 2022. Let's go a little further into the future. If Jesus doesn't come, let's go into further in the future and look at the 12 in-demand jobs by 2030. Top one, organ creator. Now, this is the thing. This is why you don't see doctors and nurses and chemists as involved as part of in-demand jobs because the medical, the biomedical engineering field is looking at producing robots that do a lot of the medical work that doctors, nurses, chemists do. That's dangerous, but that's a whole different discussion. Organ creator is something you've never heard about, and that's your homework. That is your homework to find out what is an organ creator. Do you know that there are organs that are created like the lung, the heart, that persons are testing right now that have been created to replace um, organs in the human body because there has been a decline in uh, the, trans, the, the, the donor transplant database. 
And so a lot of engineers, a lot of biomedical engineers are creating synthetic organs that can replace um, the human organs that we have that tend to decay over time. Listen, the reality of this scientific research is it doesn't matter what organs we create. Because of sin, organs will still have to be replaced eventually. And that is why our hope has to be not in our jobs, not in our cash, but our hope has to be in Jesus Christ that he promises to prepare a better place where we don't have to depend on organ creation. Because if you replace one organ, it doesn't mean that another organ would fail. And the human body is not designed to be organ run and survive on organs. Organs will still fail because anything that a man creates has a tendency to fail. That's why we change cars so often. That's why we change our phones so often. Have you realized that the moment you buy the latest iPhone in two, three, four, five years, sometimes even sooner, that the iPhone starts giving trouble? I just bought an iPhone from a friend because my iPhone, I don't know what iPhone it is, but this is it. My iPhone just started giving me trouble. The memory went full. Uh, it keeps telling me I need to install, install. And when I try to install, I have no space. That is the same thing that happens to us. If we don't have a hope in Jesus Christ and the hope that he will prepare a better place for us, we're going to be trying to install organs, install updates. We're going to try to find the best job. And it will come to a point where that will not be sufficient. After organ creator, we have augmented reality journey builder. And this is a career that you got to go look up because this is a career where it talks about you being able to put on glasses and you can be in Japan even though you're in the Bahamas. So you wouldn't have to take a plane trip to Japan to vacation. You can just put on augmented reality glasses and take vacation a whole week in another country just by using the glasses that are designed with augmented reality journey. Biofilm installer, earthquake forecaster is another career in demand by 2030. Makeshift structure engineer, rewilder, rewilder, which is another type of engineer. Human machine teaming manager. And watch this. <laughs> that is so good. So even though engineers cr are creating these robots to have a robotic revolution by 2022 and beyond, humans still need to program the machines. Okay. Humans still need to give maintenance to those machines. So you have human machine teaming manager. You have digital currency advisor. If you go to the Netherlands, they don't use cash. They use digital currency. And that's where the world is going. That's why we have this insistence on online banking. Then we have drone traffic optimizer. So very soon, you're going to see FedEx and Amazon sending things to people using drones and not these large airplanes that they use now. So maybe if you order your weave or your dress or your glasses or, or a fridge online, it may be delivered to you by a drone. We have self-driving car mechanics. So very soon, we're going to, and it's already out there, we're going to see some cars that can drive themselves and so self-driving car mechanics are becoming in demand. You're going to have agile supply chain worker and trash engineer, aka garbage designer. So there's a lot of emphasis right now in the demand market for recycling our garbage because the world knows that if we continue living life the way we live it, not taking care of our environment, human life as it is, cannot sustain on this earth. If we don't take care of our environment, if we're not careful with protecting the marine resources, if we're not careful on not littering, if we're not careful on not using plastic, if we don't take care of our environment, the researchers, the scientists know that the earth cannot sustain human life. And this is the funny thing. These are oftentimes people who are atheists. And if God created the world in the beginning, in Genesis chapter one, and he told us what is his ideal for humanity. And you're looking at all the signs and you're realizing, hey, earth can't sustain itself. It should lead you to the creator. But what are we doing? We're trying to find a way to get the space. But no matter where we try to relocate to, sin will always be a problem. And sin will always travel with us. And wherever sin relocates, there's suffering, there's joblessness, there is hopelessness, there is cashlessness, and sadly, there is death. So, next slide. 
crisis-proof careers, based on all that we just discussed, are jobs that are always in demand. So don't go to the University of the Bahamas thinking, hey, let me study this career that makes me a lot of money. And thinking that having a lot of money now means that you're crisis proof. No, because you can get a rare cancer that wipes out all of your finances. You can get in an accident that wipes out all of your finances. The job market can crash because of a crisis that wipes out all of your finances. The reality is there is nothing called a crisis proof career. What makes a career crisis proof is that it is a job that is always in demand. And that's what we need to look at as young people when we are studying a career that our career that we are studying has fields, has options that we can always be in demand. That leads me to the next question, the next slide, Chris. That leads us to the question we have to answer tonight. How to stay in demand with my career? How to stay in demand with my career? Next slide. So I'm going to end with this. The concept of disruption by J.E. Rash in 2017. He wrote a dissertation, a dissertation, a dissertation, <laughs> He wrote a dissertation on the concept of disruption. In his, in his dissertation, he said that a tool for innovation and transformation in business and society is what he defines as the concept of disruption. Think about that for a moment. Disruption is a tool for innovation and transformation in business and society. So look at the disruptions we have in everyday life. We have disruptions in election outcomes. Look at Guyana right now. We have disruptions in radical changes in foreign policy, in climate change, in societal change, and the way we approach issues like gender, race, and religion. That's why we have Black Lives Matter. That is a disruption. We also have disruptions in systems. We have a change in the system, a radical upset that allows us to pause and reflect on our values, expectations, and ways of doing things. But Disruption happens to promote entrepreneurship because it takes us out of our comfort zone and it pushes us to a need to be creative. The concept of disruption is being embraced by many in the entrepreneurship world as tool for positive change, increased productivity, and innovation. That means, therefore, that disruption, even though we think about it in the negative light, if we change our perspective on it, we can see how disruption can provide solutions for us because it seems to be the answer to the question of how to get ahead. Whether it be in business, politics, or society, when disruption comes, we take a step back and we start to question the way we are doing things. We start to question our habits of everyday life. We start to question our systems. We start to question our dependency on the government for a job. We start to question our innovation and our productivity. We start to question the things we thought that we never would, the things we were contented with for a long time. And this is a quote I found so true. You can't do big things if you're distracted by small things. So in the concept of disruption, it is important to be able to discern the small things from the big things so that we're not distracted and defeated to give up in a disruption, but we are motivated. We find motivation in disruption. Next slide, Chris. Look at the cultural history, the sociological history of disruption. In 1960, we had a societal transformation of norms and rights. We had a disruption of social norms around women's rights and the civil rights of minorities. In 1970, we had a disruption called individualism of values and culture, where we had individual individualism rising and self-aggrandizement rising. We made up our own values and our own unique culture. Many of our Caribbean countries got independence during 1960 and 1970 during this disruption of societal transformation and individualism. 
Now let's fast forward to 2015. In 2015, we had a digital transformation. A digital culture was created where disruption came about by things being posted online that wasn't necessarily true. In fact, when President Trump won, we started hearing more of the, the, the theme, the, the, the concept of alternative facts or fake news. If you look at what people have been doing with Jada and Will, they've been taking the video and they have been using um, different means of inserting things into the video that they didn't actually say. And that is how the culture of society today has become digitalized. You know, I can take a picture of someone in the video and replace that with someone else. There's, there, there are ways of photoshopping things into the digital world to make a fake reality. And so in 2015, we saw an increase in digital transformation. That was a disruption that occurred digitally. And in 2020 plus, now I don't know how to pronounce this word, um, eclecticism. I pronounce it eclatismo in Spanish, but I don't know how you pronounce it in English, but it's on the screen. I'm just gonna call it what it is. Just, just, just laugh at home, okay? Eclecticism became a part of the cultural history of disruption. And we as millennials are known to, to, to fall into this type of disruption because eclecticism is where our ideals, our style, our values and beliefs are derived from a broad and diverse range of sources. That means that our ideas, our style, our values, and our belief system has no originality. We get it from pieces and bits and pieces of a history of disruption. And that forms a basis of our reality in today. And that is what makes it very difficult for us to be able to find crisis-proof careers because we have bits and pieces of information that forms the source of our identity. So what is the good intention of disruption? How are we supposed to navigate disruption to find a way to make your career in demand? Next slide, Chris. Mr. Rash ended his dissertation talking about an acronym called STOP. He presented this acronym meaning it, meaning strategies to transform and optimize potential. He said, you must have a time to pause. We must have a period of reflection and reformation when disruptions like COVID-19 comes. We need an opportunity to think creatively. We need to have a renewal of goals, energy, commitment, and loyalty. We need to have it within a company or outside of it individually and collectively. And we need to have a time to pause because the time pause is essential to development and growth. We as black people, we just want to work, 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 make money, make money, money, make, make, make money, get rich, get rich, get rich, get rich. But we don't actually take the time pause to grow and self-develop. So here's some of the strategies from stock to transform and optimize, optimize potential. We must avoid the negative implication of disruption, contemplate and meditate on the way circumstances need to be approached, integrate new technologies and create new academic and business plans in a constructive and affirmative way. And this is the point I will end with tonight. Learn new skills to transform and optimize your potential. And regardless of your career, no matter what job you have right now, no matter what academic journey you want to go on, learning a new skill is more important in 2020 and beyond than having a degree. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Whatever degree you got, it will not be competitive if you have not learned new skills that transforms and optimizes your potential. Employers will start looking at resumes at the last section of resumes where it says skills. No matter all the fancy masters and, and bachelors you have, they're not going to look at that if you don't know how to operate Zoom. They're going to start analyzing your skill ability to determine your job. And this is the thing. Next slide. This is happening sooner than we think. By 2022, everyone will need an extra 101 days of learning a new skill. Next slide, Chris. Look at the skills disruption. 35% of core skills will change between 2015 and 2020. That has already happened. Now, on the right side of your screen, you have the countries that have been disrupted 
by a change of skills, a demand in skills. The top half of that are the countries most impacted. But look at the countries least impacted by skills disruption. Brazil, United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Japan, Gulf Corporation Council in Asia. And you will realize that the bottom countries with the less amount of skills disruption means that they have already advanced in preparing a generation to have more skills so that they can be in demand. And these are the countries that are part of the G20. They have the most say in the global economy, the global market. No matter what is going on right now in the United States with how they're managing COVID-19, that is because there was a political disruption over a skill disruption. Now look at the disruption of skills among the industries. Look at the top section of that average disruption. The disruption of skills came into financial services and investors. That is why two years ago, um, uh, RBC started and many banks started firing more human personnel because they were going digital. You know why? Because there was a disruption in skill. Basic infrastructure and mobility disruption has taken place. Look at where skills are more in demand in information and communication technology, professional services, in energy, consumer, health, media, entertainment, and information. So if you're going to study a career in 2020 and beyond, you need to look at where skills are more needed as we progress past this decade into a new one. Next slide, Chris. So I said to you earlier that skills are more important than degrees. If you have a degree, that's okay, and it's okay to go ahead and get a degree. But getting a degree is not the uh, aha moment where I've got a degree, I, I can get a job. No, 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 no. If you have a degree, you need also to complement that degree with skills. In 2015, the skills that they were looking for was complex problem solving, coordinating with others, people management, critical thinking, negotiation, quality control, service orientation, judgment and decision making, active listening, and creativity. Now, I want you to compare that list of top 10 skills with what's in demand in 2020. They're very, very similar, but priorities have changed. One, complex problem solving remained, but then number two, critical thinking came up. Then creativity came up. COVID-19 taught us creativity. People management is now down to number four. And that is going to drop even lower in 2021 because as the robotic revolution comes into demand, people aren't going to be concerned about people management if robots speaking to you. They can give you the same thing every time you see them. Hello, how are you? That's it. So you're going to see that drop even lower to the bottom of the top 10 skills needed. Coordinating with others has dropped. Emotional intelligence is something new. Judgment and decision making came up a little. Service orientation has dropped. Negotiation has dropped. And cognitive flexibility came into the picture in the top 10 skills of 2020. Now look at 2022, the skills outlook. Declining, next slide, Chris. Declining, manual dexterity, endurance and precision. Memory, verbal, auditory, and spatial abilities, management of financial, uh, material resources, technology, installation, and maintenance, reading, writing, math, and active listening, management of personnel, quality controls, and safety awareness, coordination and time management, visual, auditory, and speech abilities, technology use, monitoring, and control. Those are the top skills that will be declining in 2022. Look at the skills that will be increasing in 2022. Analytical thinking and innovation. Active learning and learning strategics. It means that no matter what degree you have, you must never stop learning. Creativity, originality, and initiative. Technology design and programming. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking and analysis. Complex problem solving. Leadership and social influence. Emotional intelligence. That's a whole different discussion altogether. My students don't understand emotional intelligence, but people are going to start hiring people who can survive in crisis, who don't get depressed easily in crisis, who adapt to change quickly. That is what emotional intelligence involves. Number nine, reasoning, problem solving, and ideation. And number 10, systems analysis and evaluation. So in conclusion, the question, 
Next slide, Chris. How to stay in demand? The answer is easy. Use the disruptions of life to learn new skills. So let me give you this real life story, right? When I was growing up, my mom was very big on getting a bachelor's and getting a master's. So I have a brother who is 18 years old. He went in to study information technology. Man, listen, I was so mad. I said to my mom, mom, how, how can you drill in me? Oh, you got to get good grades in social studies, history, English language, and literature because you're going to be a pastor or you're going to be a lawyer and you need to make sure that you master these arts of analytical skills because that's, you need to get a degree. You know, I was like, and, and now my little brother, you just let him slip by and study information technology. I studied information technology too, but, but you didn't allow me to go into that. And he's now into information technology and engineering. And this minor is in law, so she still got a compromise. She still made sure, like she said, he fall back on something that he can be able to get any job and stay in demand. She says that being a lawyer, you can verse into any career. You know, you can go into civil rights, go into humanitarian, you can go into politics, you can go into consultancy. So, so that was a good compromise. But the guy is phenomenal at this thing called Bitcoin. The guy is phenomenal at hacking. The guy is phenomenal at working for the top security systems in the region because of his skill in information technology and engineering. Because when life throws you a disruption, you have to go back to the drawing board and find strategies to transform and optimize your potential by learning a new skill. If your job, if you were laid off or you're unemployed and your job calls you back after COVID-19, for an interview about whether to rehire you or not, they should be able to look at your resume and see that you learned new skills during this disruption of COVID-19. There are many sites online that you can go to learn new skills free. Free. HarvardX, Massachusetts Information Technology Institute, edX, all these programs you can go on, no matter what career you have, no matter what industry you work in, if your resume after COVID-19 shows that you use the disruption of this pandemic to learn a new skill, you will stay in demand. And I prophesy over your life, they will hire you because of your acquisition of new skills. So we have Bible people online tonight. And you're probably asking, Pastor Jamal, Pastor Scavella, is this in the Bible? Ain't Jesus coming soon? Do I need to learn a new skill? So now wait for the second coming? <laughs> Guess what? Go to the next slide. The Bible talks about learning new skills. Daniel 12, 4 says, But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. And the Hebrew word for knowledge is hadat. And that word also means skill. And you find it three times in the Bible in Exodus, Kings, and Isaiah. Skill in workmanship. It also means wisdom and understanding and skill. And in Isaiah, it refers to creative skill. So in Daniel, the Lord prophesied to Daniel that in the end of times, people would be acquiring and the world will increase in skill, workmanship, Wisdom, understanding, and skill, and creativity. Skill of creativity. So learning a new skill is fulfilling prophecy. Not just getting a degree, not just getting a job with the government, but learning a new skill is prophetic. You know, Jesus had a new skill. Jesus was not only a preacher and a healer and a teacher, but he was also a carpenter. And his example and the example of the disciples he chose who also had skills of fishermen, people always need food, leaves us a legacy of prophecy, a legacy of fulfillment, a legacy of strategic transformation for our potential in learning a new skill. So the last slide tells us the conclusion tonight. Next slide. A company that was started by some students of mine, a graphic design company, 
that was started in Mexico by some students. They have this as their slogan. From disruptions, great ideas are born. What idea came out of this disruption and this pandemic in your mind? Write it down, pray on it, and learn a skill to put it into action. Another student of mine said this, I tried to find a job, then I decided to start one. Maybe this is your opportunity to start a job. My quote is this, to be crisis proof, stay in demand. May God bless you. And may out of the Senegal Seventh day Adventist Church and friends come a generation who is always in demand to live out their full potential in God. God bless you. And thank you for the invitation um, tonight. I guess we can open up for any questions. All right. Um, do I moderate the questions, Ashley, or you're moderating the questions? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. So, um, Mom Joan um, has some questions, and I want to answer them. They're very good questions. I'm going to read them and then answer them. Question. First question. We are often cued into directing or supporting our children into choosing careers where we see their bent. Mm -hmm. Today, we have unconventional careers that will push the traditional careers in the background. How is the young adult slash parent now able without a strong knowledge in future career needs slash skills, channel their children to be productively fit for the future? Good question. So even if you realize that your child is gifted in a certain area, it is important to help a child to be versatile and multidisciplinary. Don't close that young person into just one career, but help them to be able to balance their gifts and their talents and uh, develop them in a multidisciplinary um, way. One of the slides and one of the research, I think it was the one about the top 30 plus careers, there, 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 was, a, there was a career there, there was a career, career uh, called liberal arts. And I, and I know Ashley's specialty is in higher education, right? I study, my master's is in intercultural studies. And Ashley can tell you, we often laugh at liberal arts because what, what is liberal arts? Like liberal arts is a multidisciplinary career where we often laugh because you can study, multi, you can study liberal arts and get any job. And when I sat down and look at it, that's the point. The point is to make sure that our youth and children are versatile, even with their niche, their specialty, to be able to have skills that make them competitive and adaptable to have any job. So don't limit them to just one area where they're gifted or where their strength is, but also push them in areas that they may gravitate to as just hobbies or as just um, play skills and help them to develop and become versatile and multidisciplinary in their trajectory for careers. So the unconventional careers still have a place they may not be as competitive or in demand. And so they will need to depend more so on learning new skills constantly to complement the career path they choose, whether it's unconventional or whether it's in demand. And the second question was, how ethical is it? And I, this is a good question. I, I give that disclaimer at the beginning. How ethical is it for a Seventh Day Adventist to engage in careers that are controversial to the sanctity of life? yet is a seemingly productive alternative to poverty? That's a good question. I sit on a committee now that, an ethics committee, that is looking at the engineering curriculum for Adventist universities. And I remember when I was in Monte Morelos, the students had a project and they went into a competition that was designing robots. The robots did a number of different things. There were robots that were self-driven. There were robots that could help in medical procedures. Um, in fact, in medical science, there are invasive procedures that are used um, via robotic instruments. All right. And so, and so there is a question of ethics. Um, so if a young person goes into a career path that 
causes an ethical question based on their fundamental belief. There's also an option, um, just how we have non-combatancy careers in military, there are also options in those um, ethical dilemmas of advocacy. So even though they have to study the research, um, the scientific data, they can also be advocates against it. One of the advocates we have, this is a little controversial, is Dr. Ben Carson. Um, he is strongly against abortion um, for whatever reason, okay? But you know, he studied in that area of pediatric medical science, pediatric neurology. And so he's an advocate, he's a pro-life advocate. So even though they go into a career that has an ethical dilemma, they can always choose the, the trap, the path of that career that does not conflict with their religious beliefs, their cultural beliefs, their ethical convictions, and actually become advocates against those actions. So we have Adventists who are involved in NASA, who are involved in environmental health, and they're advocates for um, you know, good because of where they know we stand as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. So I hope that answered your question. And it's important for us to teach our children and our youth how to stand up for their convictions, even though when they're like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys in a difficult environment. Stand for ethics, all right? You're welcome. Dia, how are you? Can you recommend some feasible skills to learn on the side? Okay, great. So here are some of the skills um, that you can learn on the side, okay? All right, I don't wanna be biased, but I'm gonna start off with um, definitely this important skill, languages. Languages is so important. It is important to learn a language. Um, there is a demand um, for persons who use, who have more than one, one language. And so if you're looking at um, expanding your scope of skill, language. Um, coding. Coding is where you have the ability to design apps, design websites, and be able to um, produce specific coding to do specific functions like the hubcat that the Ministry of Health is using right now to monitor COVID-19 victims in quarantine. That's in the software that was coded for that specific task. And so many employers, many, many persons are looking for coders who can code specific tasks in software to do specific actions. And that makes it easier to you, for you to be able to have data and to be able to have statistical research and be able to quickly interpret the data and the statistics. If you watch the government's, um, the Ministry of Health um, press conference yesterday, they didn't have the numbers on hand from Hubcat, but they were able to retrieve it quickly because once we have a coder who can do that, where it automatically generates that data and statistics for you, it becomes easier for the person that you're working for. Graphic designing, marketing, um, producing videos, videography, doing, knowing Photoshop, um, anything to do in the area of engineering, um, engineering of fixing um, gadgets. Um, this sounds weird, Dia, but I know we used to scold the young men who played video games, but guess what? Playing video games is a skill. My brothers play video games. And I, 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 I've never played video games and I, I regret it now. But drone drivers, drone pilots are persons who used to play video games and are good at managing gadgets by a simple remote control. So that has become a skill in demand. So if you put in your resume that you play video games and you're competent in um, video games and you are applying for a job in the area of engineering, they're going to look at that like, aha. So that is, that is uh, another skill. So there are a diversity, you're correct, there are a diversity of skills required these days to make sure that you remain competitive in the job market, you remain competitive with your career path, and you stay in demand. Uh, another skill, another skill is cultural diversity. So 
Persons want to hire people who understand cultures, who understand how people of different cultures think, how, who understand how, 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 how products that are being produced for different cultural markets will be accepted by the demographic of the people who reside in certain cultures. So they're looking for interculturalists, they're looking for sociologists to be able to assist um, market marketing um, marketing professionals to be able to come up with formulas to target certain cultures and be able to sell their product with the acceptance of cultural identity and diversity that will make their product accessible and ready to and ready to purchase so those are some some of the of the skills that you require all right any other question I think you can unmute your mic and ask the question if you would like to also You're welcome, Dia. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, I think that is it. But hold on, before you go, just looking at my notes, I want to give you two more skills that are very important. I, I spoke about digital and coding skills. I want to give two skills that are very important. I talk about adaptability and flexibility earlier, tech savviness, creativity, innovation, data literacy, yeah. I want to talk about these two, leadership and emotional intelligence. One of the skills that people are looking for is for professionals, is, is leadership in professionals, professionals who have a strong skill in leadership. So they're able to bring out the best and inspire um, creativity and bring out the maximum of potential in the teams that they lead because, because the world anticipates having to adapt constantly to viruses, to earthquakes, to the fluctuation of the job market. They're looking for leaders who can galvanize a team to stay constant, to stay focused in the midst of disruption. So even if you have a degree in, in anything in leadership, but if you suffer with depression or if you are unstable in a crisis or if you don't know how to stay focused, you will not be able to lead your team effectively. And so they're looking for professionals who have skills in leadership. So I want to go back to the idea of those young men who play video games. They oftentimes do it in teams. And as much as I myself am guilty of it, used to criticize playing video games in the past, I have admired in my students in faculty of information and technology. When I lecture online, the students that excel better in group projects at university level are those who are leading small groups of teams in playing video games. And that is what employers are looking for, that you have developed skills in leadership that adapt and are flexible to the changing disruptions in our society. And finally, emotional intelligence. This is closely linked to leadership and it is a skill that is becoming more important in uncertain and challenging times because emotional intelligence is the ability to be aware of, to express and control our emotions and also to be aware of others' emotions. And that is where the whole in demand career of psychology, occupational therapy comes in as an in demand job because of the skill of emotional intelligence. Companies are looking for individual individuals, not only with a strong IQ, but also with a strong EQ, emotional intelligence. And that is very important as a skill to have because it is coveted today by many large company organizations of all sizes and in all industries. So may God bless you as you seek to have crisis-proof careers by staying in demand. God bless you. And thanks for having me, by the way. Thank you, Pastor Jamal. Um, that, was, that was wonderful. Um, even being a higher education professional, I, I've learned a lot tonight myself. So again, we want to thank you for that presentation. And if you are out there and you didn't get a chance to ask your question, you can still send us in your question, or you can also put it in on our Facebook page. If you want to send us any further questions you may have, we can get those to him, and I'm sure he'll be willing um, to um, answer those for you. So thank you again, Pastor. Now we want to take a few seconds 
uh, to recognize any visitors we may be having tonight in our Zoom uh, room tonight. So if you are a visitor, uh, if you don't mind just saying hello or writing in the group, or if you are on Facebook, I'm also looking at the Facebook as well. If you're on our Facebook page and you are visiting with us, we want to hear from you. We want to say hello. So we'll give you a moment if you are here with us tonight. Is that someone I'm hearing? Okay. Well, if we have no visitors, I encourage you again to uh, share our, um, our Zoom link with your friends and family and also with your Facebook friends and family as well so they can be a part of our programs. We had two visitors. Okay. Thelma and Young and Ernestine Hebern. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So grateful to have you all with us. And I was just going to mention, we would love to have you join us on Zoom for Sabbath worship. Uh, and so I'm sure uh, if somebody had sent you that link, please ask them to send you to the link to Sabbath worship. Or you can join us on our Facebook page as well for Sabbath worship and for our AY program. So we want to keep you connected and keep you uh, in the know of what's happening with Santaville. Um, so uh, if we can get those names again, somebody just type those in the group so we can keep a uh, uh, count of those names. We also have a registration for you to fill out uh, so that we can keep a little tabs on you and so we can keep in communication with you as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dio right now who's going to with the program. Good evening, everyone. I would just like to offer a word of prayer. So can you kindly bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all you've done for us. I thank you for your many blessings upon us, God, that we don't deserve. God, I just ask that you would continue to be with each one of us as youth and as church members. God, I ask that you would continue to sustain us during this COVID-19 pandemic. I ask that you would continue to keep us in good health, and I ask that you would encourage our hearts as some of us are forced by circumstances to stay at home um, when we would prefer to be in your sanctuary together. I ask that you would strengthen us as a church family. I thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, it was indeed relevant. And I thank you for the wealth of information that we learned. God, I ask that we will apply it and that anything we seek to do in our job and anything we seek to do, that we will seek you first, God, so that we can have success in our lives. I thank you, God, for hearing and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, dear. Um, we're getting near the end of the program, but I'm going to invite our pastor now just to give us some updates uh, that we will have for the rest of the week and moving forward. So, Pastor, you can take it away. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you, uh, Pastor Jamal, for that uh, exciting presentation. We want to thank those of you who visited with us this evening, those of our very special guests, and those who are touching base with us on Facebook. Um, as we continue to try and grow each of you in your various locales. That's our purpose. God has designed us so that we can grow, that we must not be static. Somebody once said that sometimes when we cap ourselves with a, a level of thinking, it is the greatest hindrance to our growth. We think that uh, we're to be doctors or we're to be lawyers or we're to be pastors and that's it. That's all God has for us. No, God is always interested in growing you and your growth begins and continues here at the Zoom, the uh, Zoom Zoom, I call it, the Zoom Zone, all right? Your growth continues here. And so you want to stay tuned. Next week will be our final uh, town hall meeting for this series. 
And uh, we want to invite you to be with us. We want to pray for you. We're going to have a very special guest uh, from Miami uh, coming to us via our program who will be focusing on the necessity of prayer in a time like this. And then we're going to break out into our uh, various prayer groups at the end of it. And if you have a special prayer request that you would like us to pray for, you need deliverance in, in some area of your life, some condition that is is hampering you, uh, keeping you from growing and blossoming, you want to be with us next. We're going to talk about some of the principles of a powerful prayer life. And so you don't want to miss that one. And then uh, the following Saturday after that, at 11 o'clock, we will launch our Path to Life in the Box series. We believe that God has created this world and he has put a number of blessings in it for us. And we got to discover those blessings in that series. Uh, so we, we begin on Saturday morning, the 25th at 11 a.m. And then on Sunday night, we'll have Monday night off, Tuesday, Wednesday, on Thursday night off, and then Friday and Saturday. We go for two weeks in a power pack series, discovering what God has put in the creation box. We're going to go to the book of Genesis and find out a number of wonderful things. So tell everybody. Let them know that we're going to be having a wonderful time. You don't want to miss this uh, beautiful series that begins. But next week, Wednesday, we're going to pray for you. You might need healing. You might be sick. You might be having uh, financial challenges or family challenge or, or relationship challenge or, or a spiritual challenge. You know, um, uh, we talk about uh, emotional health and uh, emotional intelligence. Well, there's one other intelligence that is most necessary, and that is spiritual intelligence that's the foundation of all other intelligences all right so you want to be with us for this very very exciting time uh path of life series november or rather um july 25th at 11 a.m uh and then uh we continue throughout the week so you don't want to miss any of those we're thankful for those of you who have tuned in this evening and one of our guests this evening will get a 25 dollar gas uh, certificate uh compliments of soul uh, um, petroleum here in the Bahamas and we want to thank uh, Mr. Val Hanna for that gift and so uh, we will be sure to get some of you have got your mask already uh, we still have one or two other gifts to give out next week so you don't want to miss it and uh, let's um, continue to have a wonderful time listen God is in charge he is in charge and he has uh, this world in his hands. So you don't need to worry. You just need to put your trust and faith in God and God will uh, see you through. He will see you through. God bless you. It's certainly been a pleasure to have you once again this evening. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Ashley as he concludes uh, this evening. Thank you so much, Pastor. As we wrap up this evening um, and as Abigail get ready to do the closing prayer, I just wanted to leave some words of encouragement with you. Yeah from Thomas Paine it says I love the man that can smile in trouble and that can gather strength from distress and grow brave by reflection and it further says this is the business just the business of a little man uh, who shrinks but he whose heart is firm and whose conscience proves good conduct will pursue the principles of God unto death and so I just wanted to share that with you. And now I'm going to invite um, Abigail to lead us in our closing prayer, and we will be dismissed for the evening. All right. Good night. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for tonight's message. I ask about that we use it and help guide our choices in life. And I ask Lord for the upcoming events that you bless it and take us through the rest of the week safe. And... I just want to ask you to guide and protect those. And I thank you for the visitors who are listening in. May you also bless their lives. I just want to pray. Amen. Man, have a Thank great you. evening. Okay. I hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, thank you. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Ernestine and Thelma. Nice having you. Bye -bye. Thank you, too. Bye everyone. Lovely Thank program you. tonight. Lovely program tonight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>